Cassis is a scientific imager. We pick specific targets for their scientific purpose. And actually, what the public sees are just simply the prettiest ones out of a whole row of pictures that we're taking. Um, altogether, there are 25 co-investigators in the, uh, in the Cassis team. And they're some of the best Mars scientists in the world, coming from many different countries. Cassis does fill a scientific hole that we currently have in, Mar in observations of the surface of Mars. This is Cassis. Well, at least it's a mock-up of it. It's, um, it's, most of it, functional structure is, is there, mm -hmm. except we don't have mirrors in it. So, wait and see. We have a database, and inside this database, what we can do, we can point and uh, look to see on the surface of Mars where we would like to have images taken. The spacecraft flies over the surface in a well-defined orbit. That's given to us by the European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt. Then we take the uh, database and see where the spacecraft is flying with respect to the targets that we've entered in the database. Uh, and so then we can pick and choose along the, along the orbit uh, which uh, targets we might like to take. Now, typically, Cassis will be able to take two targets per orbit. And so if there are five or six possibles, then we have to make a priority list. The scientists can say, hmm, that's interesting. That's not so interesting. Let's take that one first. The first thing that we do is that we put the targets into a target file um, called a CTF, a Cassis target file. And uh, we, we then send this file to ESAC in Madrid. This is another European Space Agency center. And what they do with it is that they look and check to see if the resources that we're using are compatible with the spacecraft timeline. Cassis is not the only other instrument on the spacecraft. Also, the spacecraft has to do other operations like communicating with rovers on the ground. So all of those things have to fit together. Um, but once that's done, uh, we can then, we receive the target file back again and saying, OK, you're good to go with this. And then we start to produce the commands. Um, Cassis actually understands commands in, uh, uh, in hexadecimal, uh, telling the instrument in bytes what to do. Um, and so you have to construct these hexadecimal commands. And we have a language for doing that. Uh, we use this language to produce, produce the individual commands. And we also have to slot in not merely the imaging, but also the switching on and off of the motor to rotate the camera. We have to uh, switch uh, on and off the heaters. Uh, checking and making sure that the instrument is, uh, is not rotating into its hard stops. All of these things have to be checked and then you can produce a command timeline. That command timeline then goes back to Madrid and they verify it and check it. Uh, and uh, at that point we're ready to send the stuff to the spacecraft. We have uh, um, a ground reference model, the GRM, and the ground reference model uh, is used to check and verify that the commands that we produce are actually going to work correctly with Cassis. This is the Cassis ground reference model, and uh, along with the laptop beside me here. So we have on this, on this trolley here, We've got what's called the rotation um, control module just here, the breadboard here, and the digital control module here. So the rotation control module, it, it um, drives the, the rotation of the, the mechanism just beside it here.
Um, the digital control module, this, this allows us to monitor the state of the instrument and it also acts as the digital interface between the instrument and the spacecraft. Just beside, uh, we've got the uh, breadboard of the proximity electronics, which um, mimics the, the response of, of the detector. And over here, we've got the electronics ground support equipment. And together, it's the closest thing to a flight spare that we have. It uh, allows us to test the software, and it allows us to um, help with the software development as well. And so we can also use this to test certain imaging sequences and to see if they would work on the real flight model. So the spacecraft uh, then sends the commands at, at the appropriate times to Cassis. Uh, Cassis receives them and executes them and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it because it's all blind. After Cassis executes, it uh, takes the picture, reads it into its own mass memory. Um, this is a very small mass memory, by the way. It's, on, it's only big enough for about three pictures, actually. Um, but then it's passed across to the spacecraft, and the spacecraft holds the data in a very, very large mass memory. The contents of the mass memory is sent down to uh, uh, an antenna, either part of the Deep Space Network, the European Space Agency's network, or even the Russian network that Roscosmos has. And then all that data is fed back to the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt. Um, the data is then accumulated and put into, put into uh, a, a database. And we can then pull the data from that database. The data is, in the first instance, is just a, a line of bytes and it's got all sorts of stuff in it for uh, uh, determining how many bytes there are in the next packet, um, what, what are the contents of this packet. And so we refer to this as saying that we depacketize the data. And from all of that, we construct uh, a data file that, uh, that we can read with our tools. It's at that point inside IDL, you can read a data file and then just simply type TV pixels and voila, it appears on the TV screen. And that's when you see the image for the first time. The instrument is not perfect. And so the first thing that we do is actually to remove the defects from the optics and the detector. So that means uh, removing the background. It's, uh, typically it's a background subtraction and removing, uh, removing these artifacts that come from the instrument itself. That's the first step. And then we begin to assemble the, uh, the images that Cassis takes and assemble them into strips of data. Um, you have to remember that Cassis takes images in a, in, a, in a mode called push frame mode. And it means it takes multiple images as it passes over the target. So effectively what it's doing is it's going bang, 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 bang. And what we have to do is to assemble these individual frames to produce one large image strip. That process is, uh, is itself time-consuming, uh, but we have some automated tools that also for doing that. Once we have that, then uh, we can take those final image strips and then begin to compile the stereo and the color products. So uh, there's quite a long chain of things that have to be done before we can end up with something that looks uh, stereo and color, as the name Cassis suggests. So this is Noctus Labyrinthus, and now we're going to zoom in to where Cassis was trying to take its data. When we're in the prime mission, um, we'll be getting potentially 20, 20, 25 images per day coming from the spacecraft. Uh, what we have to do is that we generate, generate our products as automatically as much as possible. We have somebody, uh, people validating 
that the, uh, that the image has come down correctly and everything's been collected. Um, that takes time, all of that process. That what we're required to do actually by the European Space Agency is to make data public six months after we've acquired it. Now, we would like to do it faster than that. So my, my aim would be to do it in three months. But it does depend a lot on the resources that we have here in Bern. Uh, you know, we need people to do that work. You know, there is a little bit of science by proxy. When you're running an experiment like this, you're committed to doing a, a lot of this work, really, to get the data out to the science team as well as the general public. And so you're committed to doing a lot of things. However, I do my best myself to try to carve out a little bit of time for doing some science. And of course, helping the students and the postdocs doing their science is also part of the joy of, uh, of working, uh, working on a project like this. Just imagine if you've got 3D Mars images, just imagine Duke playing with, playing with it like this, right? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.